computer. Sorry. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, folks. Thank you for joining us on this um, regular, regular, regular scheduled uh, large scale Scrum meetup um, event. It's um, today. It's laid back. It's Sunday morning, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, my um, good colleague, uh, remote, uh, far away uh, from Hong Kong colleague, uh, and and I would call him also a virtual friend, uh, Victor Gurdjieff. Um He's the um, he's the presenter today. He's the agile coach, software developer, and one of a uh, few certified less trainers with 25 plus experience, uh, years of experience working, uh, delivering enterprise systems in various, uh, and, and being involved in various agile adoptions around the globe. Um, he uh, started his career, I think uh, in, in, you know, the main uh, part of it was in Netherlands. And then he, he moved to Hong Kong and has been living there ever since for the last 10 years. Uh, has done a bunch of work in uh, software product development and um, adaptive product development. And uh, today he is going to speak to us about, uh, you know, a very interesting topic. He is gonna bring up this, the, the subject that's probably in many's, many, many people's minds. Um, so the output of software developer is knowledge, not code is the subject. So Victor, I'm gonna pass the baton over to you so we can just take it away and uh, manage your time and questions. If, uh, we don't have too many people, folks. Uh, too many people on a call, folks. Just raise your hand, or, or, or virtually, or just ask Victor if he wants to take questions, and uh, also use chat if you would like. Okay, over to you, Victor. Take it away. Good, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, indeed, uh, regarding the questions, or uh, if you want to say something, just just start saying. Uh, don't worry about it because the group is small; it's not going to disturb or whatever. And uh, so if you ask me something, which I'll talk about it a bit later anyway, so I might say it, but um, I don't mind even having a completely messed up planning. So uh, we have one hour. I uh, don't have a material to talk uh, myself all by myself for one hour. So uh, that's why uh, it, it's already counted for that you also, if you if you feel like, uh, hey, wait a minute, I also have a view on this, uh, uh, feel free to share it. And so we also learn from each other. So um the, the way I'm um, um, going to talk about it is uh, by presenting these statements, which are uh, on purposely presented quite, um, um, let's how to say it, sharp, uh, presented in a black-white manner. And um, uh, just to start with the first one already, developers' output is knowledge and not code. Uh, developers clearly also produce code. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, but um, there is a something really fundamental behind um, where uh, still remains uh, something I really uh, learned uh, uh, over the years that we really have to put the knowledge at the front. And that's actually what uh, the essence of the job is and um, essence not only of the individual developers, but also the teams and um, that they are producing the knowledge. It's basically a fundamental aspect of our profession, what we are doing. And um, I mean, we all also quite often say it's um, we're knowledge workers and it's the age of knowledge, et cetera. Uh, but uh, when you look at how things, and even in the agile community, are being looked at and measured and operated and organized, then uh, knowledge doesn't seem to be at the forefront. Uh, there seems to be all kinds of other things at the forefront and, and knowledge not so much, actually. So um, um, uh, I'm guessing uh, that most of you, if not all of you, are familiar very much with Scrum and all this stuff. And, um, and, uh, and, and I'm guessing that um, several of you at least uh, know uh, the new new product development game, which is a predecessor of Scrum. That's basically what Scrum is based upon. But uh, uh, interesting to notice is what it actually says as part of the document, and uh, and uh, two of the of the several things, which is a multi-learning and organizational transfer of learning. Essentially, the learning is essential to it. And um, if you look at um, how we mostly talk about Scrum, um, the learning doesn't seem to be having a, that much of a front uh, front row uh, and a seat. It's a more kind of like a, 
um, double the speed in half the time and that kind of a nonsense. And uh, um, so, um, yeah, it's uh, essentially it's uh, much more about the learning. Another one um, is um, uh, contra game. It's a concept that we um, uh, use quite a lot and talk about quite a lot in less uh, community. So um, I don't know how much is it uh, known uh, as a concept outside of the community, but it's uh, so I'll explain briefly what it is. Contra game is this uh, all too known. Uh, a relationship of um, uh, I ask you something, I have the money, and you're gonna uh, provide me. And if I'm not satisfied with uh, how much, uh, or you're asking too much money uh, for it, or spending too much time, and um, so then we're gonna have a game basically, which again goes as as, as follow. Um, I as a as a customer, or a, or a, I'm asking from a vendor or, or a software engineer, or I as a business ask from a development team, uh, can you provide me uh, something? And I want uh, this amount of work in this amount of time. And so um, typically developers uh, say back, uh, no, uh, you're going to get uh, this amount of work in this amount of time. And uh, the other side, come on, that's... Uh, and so it goes kind of a back and forth like that. And um, so um, if I stop occasionally, that's because I need to... Uh, my throat is hurting a bit. So then... Um, and um, uh, so this game goes back and forth like that, and in reality, is uh, tends to be uh, be much more complicated, as you probably know. Uh, so where there is uh, estimation and and uh, and deadlines and uh, and the pushing the deadlines and so on and so on, and um, and uh, it's an extremely widespread problem. In a, in a way, actually, I'm making quite a big part of the money that I'm making uh, with my work is uh, that uh, uh, management or, or a team so, or calling me and they say, basically, we have this very toxic uh, situation where the business is um, is asking something, they're just not happy how fast or how much the product development delivers. And then you now kind of need to go in between and see what's going on, etc. And, and try to fix that. But uh, usually it's a, just an enormous vicious circle that has been going on for too long that becomes uh, really, really bad. And um, but then I, I, um, I for a long time, um, I thought this is um, a trust problem, you know, and this is a problem of um, of uh, uh, business or management doesn't trust the engineers, you know, they need to trust. And, and um, um, so they if the engineers say uh, it's going to take us so much time, then it just takes so much time and they need to trust it and uh, then then it's going to happen, etc. And then if you go to the management and say that, like, um, you know what, you need to trust the engineers. Uh, it usually uh, react with a very confusing uh, when, when I say that. And um, also, um, not only that is also um, um, when you say, uh, so if the, if the developers, if they estimate the estimates are not so valuable, uh, you need to just uh, trust that it's going to turn out okay without much of estimates of anything like that. Um, also not really acceptable. Um, Samuel, do we mind to turn off the microphone? So he's... Sorry. Yes, folks, please. Thank you. So the, um, so the, this um, um, this is generally not easily swallowed by the management. I need to trust, and I. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, I can, we cannot estimate. Uh, so this is generally um not well uh received so it ends up in the endless conversations uh, which are really hard uh, to convince the management to trust or or to accept that the estimates are not going to be accurate and um but then the, the deeper i went uh, and especially conversations uh, that happen uh, when i sit with a, some manager in a, with a with a beer or during the dinner and then we talk much, much deeper. And, and then I ask them, and what they tell me about themselves is how they look at the product development. And I discovered essentially that they're looking at the product development as um, as something, uh, as an endeavor which produces essentially the code. And so, yes, a lot is unknown and a lot needs to be uh, discovered along the way and, when, and uh, et cetera. By the end of the day, uh, what I'm asked, it's, it's it's pretty clear. Yes, I might change my mind later on a bit, but still, I'm not changing everything. And so, um, um, so yeah, we're paying for it, and then we expect an output. And then kind of a hit me, uh, what do I mean by output? And they basically expect uh, software working in a production, and that's, that's what they actually want. 
but actually what the developers should be paid for is the knowledge and the maximizing amount of knowledge essentially because uh, think about it if you um uh, the more is unknown which is in a product development pretty much always the case if you do anything meaningful um the the higher the uncertainty about uh, what you're going to get when you're going to get it uh, or whatever uh, so um um and so uh if you want to get anything done you have to increase the knowledge so it's a, it's a really directly connected with each other uh, the more you optimize for knowledge the better the product will become and uh, so the reason why we cannot get stuff done on time and why we don't get what we want, et cetera, is because knowledge is not there at the beginning. And so, um, uh, and, and I, when I understood that, I started to then discuss with them in a different way. And this seems to then arrive a bit easier. Still not easy to convince them because they have been for decades having idea that I'm hiring developers to produce code and not knowledge, essentially. Another one, um, I don't know how, how long you've been in yourself in, in this uh, product development industry. And uh, Gene mentioned that I've been uh, in a, for, uh, for 25 years now. And so um, uh, I've seen quite a few of those rewriting an existing product uh, projects. Okay, so existing software needs to be rewritten in the new technology stuff. And what I noticed is that um, uh, there's um, um, Obviously, um, there is a project where they say we need to rewrite it, but in reality, they don't actually write existing thing. They still say we're going to need it differently, etc. So it's not really rewriting. But if you encounter sometimes really rewriting, so it was done in a wrong technology or something like that, and um, and uh, uh, wrong language, um, if it needs to be rewritten as is, then it's uh, really, really cheap to actually do that. It's kind of remarkable if you think about it. Uh, they, the, the developers really need to rewrite it. Like literally every single piece of code needs to be written again and need to be solved again. And it becomes actually much, much cheaper and, uh, to do that. So we, um, sometimes um, in the conversations, um, again, with the management, they say, uh, this product has already been uh, done before. Uh, so the new project uh, should be uh, should cost about the same amount of money, and because it's a similar thing, it's a similar project, which uh, clearly cannot be true, and we know this is nonsense, and and the, which is a kind of interesting. Why is it nonsense? Well, because what the developers produce is not the code, is the knowledge. So if your knowledge is there, then uh, everything becomes much much cheaper, essentially. Okay. So um, um, that's another example. So I'm guessing you've been you have encountered this kind of a rewriting uh, project things. Yeah. So another one is um, um, if code is output um, of developers, then you will always want to measure the uh, amount of code or features or JIRAs or whatever you want to call them being produced by the developers or by the teams. So there's another problem that we encounter uh, really, really, uh, uh, basically all the time in every organization. They, the management keeps asking, how do you measure the performance of a team? How do you do that, right? And uh, so it's a question which is impossible to give a, proper, uh, a valid answer. So this also bugs me, like, uh, how come, actually? Uh, so how do I convince management to stop asking that question? But they will not. They never stop asking the question. They, they keep asking. Uh, Please show me the measurement of how you measure performance of the teams. This happens every single time. So it used to be uh, lines of code, and we know this is horrible, uh, luckily with each step, but then we replace it with something which isn't really much better. Uh, actually, in a way, it's the same, especially the JIRAs. And, um, and uh, I actually forgot to, to put a, a, a screenshot. Somebody sent me a screenshot of a latest, the best, the most advanced way to measure the productivity. And it was, I'm not joking, it's an export uh, from, uh, it's a directly connected to Jira system, which uh, per developer shows exactly the, the lead time of uh, each Jira that they have actually delivered and stuff. And um, yeah, also the measurements such as lead time and cycle time, essentially the same problem. Think about it. So, and those measurements are in agile world even considered useful measurements, but actually the same problem. Yeah. 
and because um, it implies that what is being delivered is actually the output. Yeah. So, um, just a second. And this um, um, this is directly connected to the the question we need to estimate predict when something will be finished. Yeah. And uh, is it reasonable to ask uh, when something will be finished? Yes, of course, it's perfectly reasonable. It's a very valid question. You want to have a certain estimate, etc. Uh, but the thing is that, um, uh, so I, uh, I'm actually not a very much a fan of uh, uh, some explanations of a no estimates, etc. So that uh, we shouldn't estimate. Um, why? Because it's treating a symptom and not an actual problem. The actual problem is. Um, is uh, when we say we need to estimate and when we say we need to be finished, what exactly do we mean by that? Okay, so uh, you ask it to work, but what if you actually estimate the amount of knowledge that you need to acquire? And, uh, and uh, so the more knowledge you acquire, um, the more likely you're gonna be successful. And especially uh, when it comes to how the knowledge is gained, um, the high risks, with the least amount of knowledge you want to do the first so the the sooner you get the knowledge the easier it becomes to actually know are you progressing or not because lack of knowledge is lack of progress essentially yeah. so let me jump uh, sideways uh, it seems like unrelated to the, what i'm telling but it's actually quite related is uh, currently there's a hot topic and you're probably also they're involved in a in a chat GPT and LLMs, etc. Okay, so then you can't, you, you just can't miss it. And I, I would rather uh, not talk about it, but it's almost impossible. So, um, uh, but they, I'm definitely not going to talk about LLMs themselves. But the fact that um, uh, people have looked at LLMs don't learn. Okay, so learning hasn't been solved yet. And so, um, so those chat GPT doesn't actually learn, doesn't gain knowledge. It's a key key aspect that we need to keep in mind. So um, those tools will be, and already are right now, very beneficial for product development. So developers will benefit enormously by them and the product development generally will benefit, but it doesn't attack actually the core aspect of product development. And that uh, is my prediction will not happen in the coming decades. It's a really, really hard problem. It's a completely different problem actually. So, um, so while um, uh, so, for example, if you if you ask uh, ChatGPT to generate a code for you for a given problem, um, so what you, what you're going to get is completely dependent on what is already known, essentially. So it's based on how good your question is. Uh, that assumes that you're asking a right question, and the right question depends on 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 learning that you need to do first before you can ask a right question, uh, and then also. Uh, the, what is being produced by the chat GPT is an existing solution to it. it, it is, nothing is being learned, essentially. Okay. There's a, um, this is important. Why do I talk about this? Why do I mention this? Is because now um, it's a sign when people talk about uh, uh, chat GPT, etc., all this stuff is going to replace developers. Well, if you assume that a developer's job is to produce code, you're right. But if you assume developer's job is to produce knowledge, then you're wrong. Yeah. So there is another uh, thing which is really interesting, is the, um, um, which comes from uh, children's development in Japan. It's, um, um, it's a routine versus adaptive expertise. And it, they are very much emphasize and are very much aware of the teachers of uh, how they develop expertise with the kids. And so routine expertise is expertise of, uh, of um, knowing something really well, obviously. So uh, uh, um, uh, already um, something that is uh, developed and uh, a skill, and uh, you, you need to learn how to do it, and you just simply do it. And so, um, uh, I don't know, you can imagine a sushi chef, uh, which is... Um, having a restaurant and whole life is actually it's a sushi chef in a restaurant and that sushi becomes absolutely perfect. Okay? So, and people love to go to eat that sushi and because over time becomes better and better on doing the sushi. Um, and so that's called routine expertise. Uh, this over time, the routine becomes more and more 
perfected essentially. Um, the same applies to uh, uh, like a, being a Java developer, UA designer, um, uh, being a, a part of a, a limited group of people who are working on a, some component or microservices. Okay, so they focus on that. That's what they do. That's what they're doing really well. They maintain, deliver the features for that, etc. Okay, adaptive expertise is um, is a different uh, type of a skill and a different different type of behavior. Um, uh, these people and the skill that you expertise that you have is a problem solver is a somebody who's actually depending on what is happening around you knows how to adapt to that situation and uh, it's typically also related to innovation so you need to do something out of the box something different etc uh, so it's also uh, um, uh, very much demands the broadening the, uh, the, the the perspective so you have to actually as a developer or as an individual you have to typically look much much broader uh, you need to have to look at things from end-to-end -end point of view. Uh, you have to look from a custom point of view, from a whole product point of view. Not from, I need to do this component thing, but I need to solve a custom problem. So um, uh, also difference, uh, and this may be the most direct difference between routine expertise and uh, adaptive expertise, is that routine expertise is, um, 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 is really efficient uh, by having... Um, uh, uh, a very deep uh, skill of something. So uh, the skill is really, really good. And that's why the efficiency comes from. Well, adaptive expertise about actually is really good in ac acquisition of the skills. Okay, so a different type of uh, uh, behavior, essentially. So um, this means that somebody can learn really fast, uh, but doesn't necessarily require only IQ to do that, but there is a much more uh, to it, uh, like uh, the previous experience that you have. And typically in a software development, we know that, that a damn good developer um, that we consider a really good developer is really somebody who knows only software uh, uh, programming language. It's a, usually somebody who knows multiple programming languages, which we consider again, a damn good developer. Okay. It's also related to that. Now, why do we talk? What does it mean essentially? Uh, it means that uh, in reality, what we notice is that too much emphasis on the routine, routine expertise and not enough emphasis on adaptive expertise, which is essentially expertise of creating knowledge essentially. And um, so, um, does it mean that routine expertise is not important anymore? Uh, no, it's still important, uh, but uh, we have to have a much more of adaptive expertise also. Okay. And one doesn't, it's not a, it's a false dichotomy if we say uh, I, one or the other one. No. Hey, folks, um, is it me, my connection, or did Victor get uh, disconnected? Ah, recording stuff. Gene, we gotta wait. Okay. Hey, folks, I'm sorry. <laughs> we uh, I got dropped. I thought it was Victor. Were you still able to continue? Yeah, yeah. We're going to now. Go on. Uh, I bet. So um, another one is we um all uh, if you say testing automation, let's say product development. Okay, so uh, we say that's really important testing automation. So what is testing automation? What's the point of it? Now, one point is that you increase the speed of development, right? Uh, so instead of uh, every time you need to deliver the, uh, something, you um, um, instead of doing manual testing every time, you can do automated and it speeds up stuff. And the second one is the quality, obviously. Okay, if you, for all kinds of reasons, don't need to explain that. And, um, but what's interesting is that actually testing automation, especially in the long run, is also about retaining knowledge. Um, so I had a, a long time ago, and it, it puzzled me for many years. Um, 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 I forgot his um, name. Yeah, it was one of the uh, uh, one of the big names in in the software industry. He, uh, I had a, I had a, I gave a presentation on a software that we did uh, replacement of existing system with a new one with a completely new uh, with with the somewhat similar features and stuff, but uh, eventually it became a slightly different etc. So I, I explained how we did it, and so he said, 
why didn't you just generate the system from the tests? And I was kind of like, I didn't know how to answer this. Like, uh, hmm? what do you mean by that? And um, well, you can just generate the system from the test. If your tests are actually perfect, you can just generate the whole system. And um, and I, uh, I yeah, I, uh, I didn't know. I, at that moment, I didn't know. It actually, after that, I've been thinking about that quite a lot. Like, actually, he's, he, he, theoretically, that should be possible. There's nothing wrong with that. And uh, you, could, you could literally do that. And um, um, uh, it just, uh, I haven't seen it yet, done yet, but I can imagine uh, uh, situations where they should be perfectly possible. You just need to have a, have a test, which are absolutely perfect, uh, which, is, which is possible, which is nothing, nothing special. And um, so, um, um, but then I uh, start to wonder, wait a minute, if you could do that, that means that the knowledge of what the system does is actually in the tests. And, um, and um, it, uh, and it's it's usually if done properly, it's also more readable and stuff. And um, um, so this um, this benefit is typically not seen on a short term because the knowledge is still in the heads of the people. Uh, so if as a developer you're developing a, a, a feature, let's say, and you build that feature, and then you create tests for that feature, let's say end-to-end -end test, and then after some time, like a couple of sprints later or something like that, you need to do something about this uh, feature. You, you generally don't really recognize or don't see the benefit in the knowledge when it comes to the tests. I mean, maybe, maybe a little bit, but you uh, tend to look at the code and that's okay. And um, but uh, but as a, as the time passes, people start to forget things, uh, and uh, so that's unfortunate about us human beings. When you build up a certain knowledge, uh, that knowledge you can there is no limit to building up the knowledge in our heads. The problem is that if you do not exercise the knowledge, you start to forget it uh, if you don't do anything about it. And uh, so, a testing automation uh, can be a very valuable uh, uh, way to actually retain that knowledge. That's the big benefit of it. So um, how many of you are, are familiar with the uh, team topologies or team topologies book? Anybody, how many? Yeah, one, anybody, a little bit? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, or two people at least. Yeah, it has become uh, nowadays a very, um, very popular uh, concept in a book and, uh, sorry. And, uh, and a key aspect of it in a book is a so-called team cognitive load. And um, um, so uh, team cognitive load, I, I thought when I was reading that book and before, I thought it's the same as a cognitive load. Now, let me explain what a cognitive load actually is, uh, in case you don't know. Uh, it's um, cognitive load is your... Uh, ability to hold information simultaneously uh, as a way to process information when it comes to the sensory. Uh, so you kind of, a, uh, when you're solving a software problem, you look at all pieces at the same time of, of your software problem and try to figure out what to do and how to solve it, etc. And this happens more or less simultaneously, essentially. You need to hold all of that at that moment to do that. And, uh, and so when you, when you finish it, when you solve the problem, what happens, you're basically move to the second problem and and you uh you unload as if as if it is a memory as if it is a, some kind of a um uh like is a, as if it is a computer essentially and then you focus on something else and you switch context and then you uh load something else and you process that etc uh so um what it is is that apply the concept to um to team as if it is a uh, such thing as a team cognitive load but the problem is uh, that uh, the definition they use is not the actual cognitive load. It, it's a, a way to say, you know what? One team uh, is able to deal with a limited amount of components or applications or microservices and a limited amount of features. That's why teams should have ownership of that and they shouldn't share ownership across many teams, et cetera. So you cannot burden the team with too many components, too many features, too many, et cetera. Uh, why? Because their cognitive load gets overloaded. Okay, That's what a, basically more or less the book says. Uh, the problem is that we confuse the actual cognitive load 
with with that manifestation where I just explained, which means that um, there's nothing wrong uh, if you really take cognitive load into consideration. There's nothing wrong with one team in one sprint working on one feature, the next sprint working on a completely different feature, and then on again different feature, and altogether it could be one billion lines of code. There's, uh, there's nothing. There's nothing in human brain which limits doing that, as long as it's not happening at the same time, obviously. Yeah. It's just called uh, called humans, which learn, and they keep learning. It just takes time. So that would be a good argument. If you ask a team to work for some time on one feature, and then another one, and then another one, and another one, it's going to take time for them to learn all of that. So that's a cost. But there is no limit to it. Yeah. So... Um, this is, um, uh, again, uh, uh, really important because um, uh, the, the term team cognitive load and team topologies and also uh, team owning the microservices uh, separate from each other, so team ownership. The main reason for that is uh, is idea that the teams are uh, there to produce code and maintain the code. But the teams are there not to produce or maintain the code. They are there to build knowledge again. Yeah. Okay, so um, now how does it actually, um, um, uh, how does it relate to less actually? And um, so uh, in less essentially is uh, really um, designed with this idea, underlying idea that the people learn. Uh, it's it's an organizational setup which is created for learning. So the previous statement here, organization has to be designed for learning or knowledge, uh, or knowledge will not grow, essentially, if you don't have organizational design, which enables that to do to happen. So when we say in a less uh, feature teams, and, um, and when we explain feature teams, people are quite often astonished by how is it possible for people actually to be able to do so much and collaborate with others and coordinate and solve the customer problem and develop in different technologies, et cetera. Well, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It just means we're creating a setting within which they start to learn much more than they typically previously do. And so over time, uh, then magic starts to happen, but it doesn't happen overnight. Okay. Now, um, let me show you um, a clip. I think I need to play it. Uh, no. Wait a minute. I don't know if you... Just a second. Um, play in window. And then like this. Uh, stop share. So I'm going to show you a clip of um, uh, this is a multi-team refinement session in LES. And uh, so this is a company in uh, Indonesia, Jakarta. And most of the people are in Indonesia. And some of them are in Singapore and some in India, but 80% uh, are in Indonesia. So um, you lost your audio. Sorry, I tip uh, when I cough and I forget to tip it on. When I... <laughs> so thank you. So the, um, this is a, a less huge in the um, uh, adoption uh, at a company called Jago and um, a bank uh, uh, and a new type of a virtual bank and stuff. And um, and uh, the, the purpose of this bank is to... Um, to help uh, underprivileged Indonesia with the financial needs, and so they typically in Indonesia uh, how they how most many people, especially poor people, manage their finances is literally uh, holding uh, having a book and they write all the ins and outs uh, of, of the money, and so not a great way to do that. So they want to create a product uh, which can be installed on a on a cheaper phone and a smartphone, and they can manage it better. So they they already done that, and now this is progressing, and. Um, uh, so it's a quite many teams and less huge. There's about seven requirements areas. So each requirements area is about uh, five, six teams. And um, and uh, you see here one of those areas. So you see about eight teams, I believe, all together here. And they're doing refinement. And um, so uh, what you already see is that um, uh, groups of people. And so those groups of people, and um, let me play. 
So those groups of people, they um, uh, on the screen we show the items that need to be refined, and uh, and they are standing together and they are refining. Now refining means in this case learning from each other. They're building basically knowledge, and that's the ultimate purpose of of refinement, to build up knowledge, to spread the knowledge, to share knowledge, and um, um, and and. Uh, end result of that, which is a uh, which is a more practical thing, is that you have these items which come out of that, uh, which uh, become part of the backlog. And so uh, groups are not teams; uh, they're just simply mixed uh, people uh, with different backgrounds, and um, and um, uh, they take an item and they start discussing and keep discussing that. And uh, if you have, for example, somebody senior and who knows a lot, uh, I typically ask him to uh, be passive, uh, meaning that people who are less knowledgeable about the topic, they um, need to uh, ask questions uh, to, to get the knowledge, to gather the knowledge. So everything is optimized for maximizing amount of knowledge. And uh, groups are clearly small uh, because knowledge is created by interaction and, and maximized by through interaction. And um, uh, if you have somebody... Uh, just telling something, um, and uh, that typically doesn't arrive much. And yeah, so what I tip, what typically happens in this case, I mean, what you see it looks nice, but before this and after this, um, and this is just one of the groups, and there's a, like a six, seven other groups. Uh, what happens is that uh, there's a lots of conversation about is this efficient? Because uh, you can imagine they spend up to a full day doing this. And uh, so people, there are lots of people talking to each other and uh, everybody needs to then know and learn stuff. Is this efficient? And um, and uh, it's hard to answer that question because the, the, the reason why they ask that is because the underlying idea is that uh, the people are there to produce code. These are all coders and they are not coding. It's not good because they're supposed to be coding. And so, because that's the productive time. And... Um, and uh, so uh, that makes it quite hard. But the more we realize, actually, uh, they are there to produce knowledge, then this meeting proves to be extremely productive, actually. And uh, and uh, then if you want to optimize it, it can always be better, obviously. You need to talk about how to maximize, how to make it more effective, this knowledge creation. Then a conversation uh, is very useful. Uh, every meeting can be better, including this one. Uh, so, but then the question should be, how do we improve? How do we maximize the amount of knowledge that we create in this meeting? Yeah. Share again. I like that insight because like when, when I'm trying to get my teams involved in even doing some like long-term estimation it's like well we don't want everybody there because it's a waste of their time but when you when you frame it in terms of knowledge acquisition it's a very good use of their time so yeah. i really like that how we frame that thank you yeah yeah let me actually grab immediately on that one and then, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a really really many examples where the knowledge uh, plays actually a role when you talk about estimation and um, the reason why we hate estimation and almost universally is um, is because how it's being used. And uh, it's being used basically to create these arbitrary numbers in order to then uh, give a predictions and then you hold on to it and et cetera, et cetera. You get the point. And so the, in agile community is a massive discussion about how bad it is to use the story points and so on and so on. I'm actually still using user story, user story points. And... Um, why? It's just a trigger to actually have a conversation. And uh, and uh, somebody says, but there are better ways. Sure, let's do it the other ways. As long as we're having a, a, a knowledge creation session. and uh, But you spend so much time estimating. And that's, uh, that's an interesting statement. Uh, I ask, what do you mean exactly? And uh, it takes so much time just to produce one number. But what happened exactly? Well, what happened is that the majority of people don't even know what the item is all about. Ah. That's why we spend so much time. Okay, was this useful to share that or not useful to share? So it's, it's not about estimation at all. Uh, that's that's just a, an excuse, basically, to share knowledge, to increase knowledge. Yeah. So um, obviously, product increment is the ultimate measure of progress, and also the knowledge. Why do we create a product increment? In, and why why this concept even exists of iterative development in agile way of working is to get knowledge. 
is to discover is this working or not working and uh, is to discover is there a progress or not progress uh, so you're getting knowledge so typically in a sprint review uh, again a problem of a sprint review massively being um, um, misunderstood or misapplied uh, has to do with uh, with the idea that uh, the purpose of a sprint is to deliver the code and so we want to see how much code is being delivered then uh, so uh, you end up with a reporting meeting and uh, they typically rename it from sprint review to demo and um, because you need to demonstrate that you that you delivered uh, but if you understand as product development as a knowledge creation process uh, then it's about actually figuring out and learning uh, uh, are we actually solving a problem or not because that's the purpose of it getting feedback So, um, uh, so less is really designed for to to maximize learning and that knowledge, as I mentioned before. So another one is uh, this begs the question. So, okay, in that case, um, so if you uh, if you if the knowledge is the thing, uh, this means that the measuring performance of the people and the teams also actually doesn't make sense anymore, right? Because what the heck? yeah, the, uh, I mean, you you don't measure if you're building up knowledge then has nothing to do with the performance at the end, which is also true. And I, I had a big trouble quite often taking quite a lot of effort to convince management before. Um, so to um, stop measuring performance of the people and uh, of the of the teams. And there, there is like a like cursing in the church, basically, when you say that. And uh, so it's, yeah, uh, really hard to follow that for them. And, uh, but, uh, um, until you start to talk about, but wait a minute, the output that the teams and people produce is the knowledge. Uh, and it's perfectly fine to measure that. You should measure that. But then you need to measure the capability of the people and the capability of the teams. And that's actually really, really useful. And we are clearly not into communism. So people need to be paid accordingly. So this means you pay people who are more capable, but not the performance because you can't measure that because there is no output uh, in a sense of a, a code that you measured. Uh, in that way, yeah, you have to measure the capability itself, which is basically uh, all the effort that the people put in in a past time in order to build up the knowledge and the results in a certain capability right now. Yeah. So um, this begs also the question: How does a better team look like? How do you say this team is better than other team? I mean, um, uh, or I, I hate the word hyperproductive team. That's a, such a hyperbole of I don't even know what it means. Uh, so, um, but it's it just simply normal English. Uh, some teams are clearly better than others. But what does it actually mean? Well, it's a more knowledgeable team. It's a more capable team. There's a more um, team which is able and mainly able because of knowledge uh, to deliver more end to end. They understand the customer better. They understand more technology better. They understand more components better. They understand and so on. And if they do that, they will be better able to deliver end to end. They're more uh, multi-skilled, is especially important. If you have a people would stick to one skill, you end up typically with the problems of a, of a handover between people, which is gonna slow down the whole development. But if you learn a lot, uh, it will improve a lot. Now, remote working, it's a, also interesting then to extrapolate. So, so what does it mean? Remote working is very clearly limits and slows down learning. Okay, so if we say, if we at some point agree, yes, the purpose of developers is to create knowledge, then uh, I think we need to limit the remote working. No matter, I mean, there's all kinds of arguments for remote working. Uh, I clearly am sitting in this nice room and uh, private uh, stuff. But nobody, nobody denies that. I mean, I'm also doing it. But the fact is that uh, amount of learning is limited and uh, slower uh, if you do if you're sitting alone in a room. Yeah. Especially learning from each other. I mean, there's a learning that you could do individually, uh, no doubt about that. But uh, um, but uh, uh, it's not sufficient. You cannot. Uh, there's uh, the learning goes faster if you also do it together. Yeah, uh, may, may I uh, ask a question? Hello. Sure. 
Yeah, so uh, these remote uh, working, as you described, uh, does it, uh, to me, it doesn't seem uh, directly linked to working online or working together in a room. Um, you mean if you, if you as a team sit uh, online or sit in a room? Um, yes. Does it make a, a difference? It does. Uh, so definitely does. And um, if you are in a setting, I mean, it's, um, I discovered actually after having many discussions about this is the the main difference in perception is um, is when I say a team uh, uh, that's the difference. Uh, so for me, a team is a group of people which interact many times a day, uh, share the same goal, same same task, and um, they don't use Jira divide at the beginning of the sprint and see where the end of the sprint stuff. Uh, so um, they really work together to deliver every single day. And uh, they, uh, it's perfectly normal for them to do more programming team, uh, pair programming, and so on. And just imagine doing that all uh, remotely. It is possible. It's just simply way harder. Um, and then uh, that's a, that's a practical aspect, like a like a tangible aspect of of collaboration and stuff. Uh, but a second one, much more important, uh, but uh, less uh, less tangible, is the human aspect of being a team. And um, that you are behaving accordingly. You uh, uh, you really back each other up. You collaborate. You are humans, and uh, with all the socializing aspects, etc. Uh, it's a damn hard to build it up if you don't see each other. And uh, you need to have a chit chat. You need to have. Uh, you need to know each other really well. You need to have a conflict uh, when necessary. And uh, all of that is simply less optimal online. Uh, for me, this is not really opinion. So that surprised me a bit on, on, uh, when I when I see discussions about it. Very very for, uh, uh, f uh, big opinions about it. Like uh, we are in a new world, and old people don't like a new world or something like that. So that, but uh, it's just simply research and um, and new and old research, like uh, any research essentially. The, there is no research which shows remote working is uh, equally. Uh, uh, beneficial in the context that we are talking about here uh, and a productive um, as a as an in-person work so it just there isn't such thing i mean uh, it is when you don't need collaboration it, and uh, if uh, it is when you don't need to um, um, uh, yeah they simply collaborate and work together uh, as uh, uh, yeah uh, but in the context that we are talking about here uh, this is uh, the basic assumption and necessity and then talking about in that context essentially yeah. okay thanks yeah more questions remarks sharing What do you think about it? No, it does like reinforce what, like when I did the last practitioner with Craig Lerman last year, you saying, well, this only works in person, right? This really reinforces that because of the, the fact that it's the knowledge acquisition and not so much the, the code. Yep. It makes it difficult when the horse is kind of already out of the barn in terms of remote work though so there's got to be <laughs> you have to be able to bring people together because like it doesn't seem like remote work's going away anytime soon yeah i mean the reality is uh yeah i just mentioned like uh from a from a research and theoretical point of view as i tried it and pushing that point but now realistically you're right i agree uh, so uh remote work is here for to stay um and uh, so i'm mainly uh, giving a message um, uh, yes it's here to stay but it doesn't mean that magically it's uh it's suddenly uh, uh equally optimal as in person uh, so um, uh and so the question then begs practically practical advice what do you do in that case yeah uh, uh, at the very least meet each other occasionally and um, and if you need to do collaborative things such as refinement do that in person at least um yeah that kind of a things yeah um, and then you small... can have a product go ahead Eddie. thanks uh, a small question regarding uh, other practices how about uh, code reviews uh, doing online or other practices 
Uh, regarding code, okay. So uh, how uh, how to do code reviews? Yeah. Is it code yeah, review? Of yeah. Yeah. So um, is it code review combined with um, uh, pull requests or merge requests? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, there is uh, essentially nothing wrong with the uh, with the code reviews and uh, 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 itself. Um, and uh, so I uh, I. Uh, um, uh, what, but uh, usually, when what 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 is really meant, and that's why I'm asking a question, is, is the delays. Uh, so, um, meaning that uh, if um, uh, as a developer I push some code and it's being then reviewed by somebody else, and uh, and the amount of delay in between, that's the problem. So it is exactly the same with the testing. Essentially, if we say we love automated testing because it got, and the key advantage of that is that you get a very fast uh, feedback on something. Why don't we apply the same thing to the code review? Yeah, and this is ex exactly the same problem. And so we need to decrease the delay uh, enormously. And uh, so this means if you then follow the logic, you end up with a pair programming. And um, uh, so for a code review, is code review important? Yes, of course. Yeah. And uh, so, but uh, do pair programming and in order to diminish the waste. Uh, what happens um, uh, in um, in reality, especially remote work, is the delays tends to be longer and longer. Why? Because uh, when a people do work remotely, they, there's a very high tendency to, um, to, uh, to choose for asynchronous coordination and uh, instead of asynchronous coordination. So when you're working in person, uh, there is a much, it's much easier to choose for synchronous coordination, which is clearly much less wasteful in when it comes to the work required to deliver the product increment. Uh, so the work that is uh, that needs to be done, the tasks which are required in order to deliver product increment, uh, you really want to uh, do it in a synchronous way, meaning that I, I need to get the review done, so I need to get it done now. So I'm going to turn around and say, can you review it now? Because we don't have time to, to wait for that. When we're working remotely, there's a very high tendency to somehow magically uh, think that uh, uh, asynchronous coordination is then a more optimal. And so everybody then sits and waits on each other. And then the development happens way longer with lots of waste and misunderstandings, etc. So the Slack is our god, basically. Everything is put on a Slack, and then it uh, and we wait, wait, and somebody picks it up. And Jira, essentially. So Jira has become even more popular since we're working remotely, because it uh, facilitates this asynchronous way of working. Uh, just drop a Jira to somebody and forget about it. Yeah. Maru. Yeah, the I'd like to share my point of view, but uh, this I, I know where Craig and the list community are coming from. And I actually agree. If you follow, if you put yourself in the shoes and you follow the logic, you would come to very similar conclusions. But my view on this is slightly different because I think what what makes the difference is not necessarily the 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 face time, although it, it does actually improve many other things next to knowledge sharing and effectiveness, etc. So overall improves everything. But what I think makes the real difference is the interactivity and the engagement. That people generate with each other. That means, let me give you a stupid counter example. I'll push it to the extreme, so a bit ca ca caricaturally, so you can understand my point. Uh, you put everybody together in the office. There is no, there is no energy there. There is no flow. There is no nothing going on. It doesn't help much. In fact, it might even destroy the team. So you need an intervention and coaching and stuff like that. Um, but you put them all over the world, like some of them in Hong Kong, like yourself and, and me in Europe and, and some other people in Africa and some other in North America, but they, of course, if they have met before, it helps a lot. It does help. There is a lot of stuff that happens between people when their bodies are present. Uh, but uh, um, if they have the right facilitation, the right engagement, the right interactivity, they mob together, I don't know. There is a ton of ways. If people are willing, that means they want, it's intrinsic. They really want to. That actually leads to that um, flow of work establishing itself, and you know the snowball effect of getting rid of a lot of impediments and finding ways to work together. Uh, these hundreds of tacit ta knowledge pieces that appear and the tactics that appear inside a team that cannot be easily reproduced elsewhere that improve the efficiency of that team. And that's what I mean by snowball effect. The going to be mark is that it has this exponential um, 
impact on, on the performance of a team once you get that that means if you disturb the team and put pieces out of the team or um, change the boss or something you will see immediately a drop in performance and stuff like this but i'm going to stop here because this is actually quite a big topic in organization engineering and change management and that's my point of view so in summary uh, what people are could be looking for is interactivity, uh, interaction, sorry, and engagement inside the team. Yeah. So, um, yes, I've, um, reminds me, uh, the time is already up, but uh, just uh, maybe this final thing uh, um, to add to that is an additional perspective on it. And um, so, um, reminds me of, uh, of uh, discussions on, um, on, uh, on organizations have all kinds of roles in the teams and just out of the teams. So they uh, they have a, 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 speci a special person who's product manager and then a business analyst or maybe a product owner and then developers and then designer. And uh, uh, typically Mar Marty Kagan uh, uh, set up uh, stuff, et cetera. And, um, and then a statement is made. Um, these people, they, 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 um, if they are motivated and they, um, uh, nothing standing away, they're gonna create a, pro a great product, and this is clearly shown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is absolutely true, and there are definitely clearly cases. I've also seen teams which have these roles and these constructs and stuff, and they produce a great product. And uh, why? Uh, one of the reasons why is because they more or less ignore those roles and they just work as a team. And um, um, why, why did I explain that? Is that um, um, I, uh, for some reason, pay attention much more on these conditions, which affects the majority of the teams. And um, um, so, um, so uh, let's say you have, a, you have a, like a, a 50 teams, so none of them is actually uh, functional. None of them is really working as a team, which is typically the situation, a majority of the teams that we encounter. And so now begs the question, uh, what is exactly standing in a way in order to have those teams really work well together? And um, so, um, so uh, one of the things which I just mentioned is uh, if you have a bunch of roles and people just sit in their roles and not collaborate, Another one, as I just mentioned, is also remote working. Yeah, and then uh, this means that you're still absolutely right. Okay, so that's uh, still the case, but um, um, uh, uh, it doesn't change the fact that if you if they would be sitting together and if they would be, uh, let's say, not having their own specialized roles, they will probably collaborate. Or chance of collaborating more is higher. It doesn't mean that they cannot collaborate. It, they can, but the chance is higher. So I don't contradict you. It's just um, um, to to see a bit more in a com more complex perspective. Yeah. Good. Gene, time's up, right? I'm happy to continue uh, with other questions. We, we we're kind of out of time technically on, on the clock, but uh, if there is another, if you have a few extra, I know it's getting late for you, so I want to be you know respectful. No problem for me. So if you have more questions, more sharing. Go ahead. Yeah, folks, uh, take advantage uh, uh, of this. If, if you have something you would like to ask, please do so now. If not, forever, ever hold your peace. <laughs> I know some people are looking into, see, some people are looking in, most of them are looking into Sunday, not, not into Monday. So who knows what people want to do. Any other questions for Victor? Ah, I get going once, going twice. Um, well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I guess we're just going to have to wrap this up now. Uh, I want to uh, thank again, Victor, to you personally for finding the time to make it um, to this um, Sunday event. It was, as always, very informative, very interesting. Thank you all for joining and thank you for your questions. Um, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the weekend and look uh, into the upcoming week. Um, so I'm going to stop recording. It, yeah. Uh -huh. And if you have any uh, 